let me just go here. Um, my name is Jane Gordon. I think some of you know me. Oh, thank you. I was invited onto the ship to show my jewelry. Um, and the first time I, I got on the ship, I was asked to give a seminar about my jewelry. But what I decided to do instead is give a seminar about happiness, because my jewelry is all filled with symbolism about happiness. So what you're going to have is a seminar about all my philosophies of life, which are illustrated by my artwork. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I was living in London. I went to London for five days. I accidentally stayed, stayed six years. And uh, a kind of a bon vivant man around town, Don Munson, everybody called him Uncle Don, was kind of making a pitch for me. And he told me, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy something so close that even the experts have trouble telling them apart. And I was instantly captivated by the idea of the happiness expert. And the reason is that um, I was struggling a lot to, to be happy. I always struggled to be happy. I had no idea how to find any amount of happiness or peace. This is a picture of me, whoops. Ah. OK, this is a picture of me when I was 12. And this will show you a little bit about the, what the world saw. But this is a self-portrait I came across from about the same time. And you can see that this was not a happy little girl. This was a picture of me in my 20s living in London, rock and roll days. This is a picture of me in my 30s in the corporate world. You can see I cleaned up the act a little bit. But again, from the outside, I probably look like a reasonably happy person. And this was a self-portrait I did somewhere in my 30s. Um, obviously not what you want to see on the inside of yourself. So I struggled to learn how to be happy. And I would say, this is me now. And I'm not saying I'm always happy every minute of every day. We all face challenges and we fall. I think every successful person knows what a failure they are, meaning how many times they fell on their butt to get where they are. Um, but I can tell you that happiness is my home now. And even though I might lose my way sometimes, I know how to find my way back home. And that's what I want to share with you. But more important is how to take other people along with you, because that's as difficult as finding it yourself. Whoops. Now, Howard Aiken said, don't worry about people stealing your ideas. If your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram them down people's throats. Well, you can't ram happiness down people's throats. When I learned how to be happy, of course, what did I do? The first thing I did was I turned around and I saw my family. And I, and I said, you don't have to do this. You don't have to be this way. You don't have to be angry. You can forgive dad. You, can, you know, I was so excited to share with them all these ideas about how to be happy. And the word came back, oh, when did Jane become so officious and bossy and overbearing? And so what I learned was that, well, I am not having an easy time with this. You shouldn't should people. You can't point to someone and say, you should do this. You don't have to be that way. You can't point a finger. You shouldn't even should yourself. I should have, would have, could have. It's just going to make you miserable. So what I've discovered kind of by accident is that the symbolism in my jewelry gets people to ask me questions. Oh, that's really pretty. And I can say very gently, do you, oh, do you want to know the symbolism in it? And it allows me, without pointing a finger and putting someone's back against the wall or putting their guard up, it allows me to put ideas on the table and open up really interesting discussions. And then if the person wants to take those ideas later on and think about them and apply to themselves, then it, it opens up that opportunity. Um, I love Taoism. And I'm going to quote Lao Tzu a lot of times in this. Uh, Taoism is about 5,000 years old. Um, actually, maybe 6,000. It's way older than Judaism, about 1,000 years older than Judaism. It's the oldest religion that I know of. And one thing I love about it is that it, there is no God. It's just a religion of the natural harmony of the universe. And in Taoism, they believed that if you were in a crowd of people, you would never know who the leader is. And the way they say it is, when the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. This is what I call my jewelry, wearable, shareable happiness. 
Um, Plato said, one of the greatest privileges of human life is to become the midwife to the birth of a soul. Sometimes that soul is your own. So now I'm going to talk about my steps to happiness. And the first one is choice. Um, common sense versus uncommon sense. In Plato's analogy of the cave, he talks about society, like people being chained up inside of a cave, forced only to stare at one wall. And all they know about life is the shadows on the wall. So they develop this whole philosophy and hierarchy of what they think the shadows mean and who's the most important person according to their interpretation of the shadows. And, and this is society. And um, Plato talks about the, the role of the visionary as if a person escapes from this, this cave. At first, he goes into the sunlight in the real world. And the first thing that's going to happen is the truth, the sunlight, is going to hurt his eyes because his eyes have adjusted to the dark. But then eventually, he'll become accustomed to it and he'll really be able to see the truth. But now, if he tries to come back into the cave, he's going to be blinded again by the darkness. So all the people are going to think he's stupid because he can't even see the shadows on the wall, which of course is life to them. But then when his eyes readjust and he tries to tell them about the truth that's out in the sunlight, they're going to be angry at him. They're going to think he's stupid and crazy and retarded and, and lost his mind. And he's not only is he telling them about something they have no capability of seeing, but he's going to challenge everything that they think is important. So this is common sense. This is us as a society trapped inside the cave, chained and staring the wall. And I call having that extra vision and having the courage to break those chains and question everything I call that uncommon sense. So for me, I used to think that life was mostly, this is given, and we got a couple of choices out on the edges there. But what I've learned is that um, everything is choice. Now for me, in my struggle to learn how to be happy, I spoke to philosophers and religious leaders, and I went to literature, and I tried everything. And, I, and one time I was speaking to a rabbi, and he said, in Judaism, we must choose life. And I, I got to tell you, that was a big choice for me. I, I really didn't want to keep going. In fact, the only reason I'm still alive is that I knew that the one thing I seemed to have done right was somehow accumulate friends through every part of my life that were loyal and kind and loved me for reasons I didn't exactly understand. And I didn't want to hurt them by letting them think that they could have changed my mind. And that was my, my one big hesitation. So. My first step to happiness was choosing life. And I made this necklaces um, inspired by the DNA strand, which is, of course, the building blocks of life. And I especially like the one mixed with pearls because pearls is really one of the only gemstones that have come from some living creature. Then I started thinking, well, if I can choose something as fundamental as life, Maybe I could choose to be happy. Maybe happiness, now this is I think all obvious to us now with a little perspective in life, but when you're in your 20s, it wasn't so obvious. You know, you think that the right job or the right boyfriend or the right this or that is gonna make you happy. But then I said, well, maybe I could just choose happiness. So this is my little happy bird. And on the back, he says, let's sing. I, I actually wanted to write I'm so happy I'm singing, but I didn't really think I could fit all those words on the back. So I realized we can choose how we think. We can choose how we see. We can choose everything that goes through our minds. Now, you cannot directly affect your emotions. You can't just say, bam, I'm going to be happy today. But what you can do is you can change your thoughts, and you change your thoughts and your thoughts change your emotion. And that follows just as night to day. It's a sure thing. Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet, the king of, of self-agonizing. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I like to use quotes because I figure these people have better creds than I do. So I'm going to show you that smarter people than me already said this stuff. There's nothing that I'm going to tell you today that's original or new. It's just that we all somehow have to keep relearning and relearning the same things. Um, this is about how what you look for in the world is what you see. Um, 
If you notice, the horse is in a heart shape, but you might not notice that at first. And on the back, it says, love is everywhere. And I have this in different shapes in palm trees and flowers and swans. And I used to know this girl, well, I still know her. Uh, I know a woman and she, she thinks everybody lies to her. I told her, oh, I met a really nice guy on Match.com and the poor thing, his wife died of cancer. And that's all she knew about him, as much as you know about him right now. She said, he's lying. And I was stunned. Why would anybody assume a guy would lie to me about his wife dying of cancer? And worse than that, I thought, what does the world look like to this woman who thinks everybody's lying to her? Can you imagine me looking out at all of you now and assuming that you're all just horrible people? I would be so uncomfortable standing here. Or if you were sitting there thinking everything I said was a lie, it, it would change your whole feeling about everything I say, which has nothing to do with reality. So what you look for is what surrounds you. If you look for the best in everybody, even if someone is 90% crummy and 10% good and you look for that 10%, you just put yourself in a 10% better world. And it's also my belief that if you look for the best in people and give them your faith, I think people will try to show you their best. And love is everywhere. Um, and then I have my decision coins. You know, when you're making choices, sometimes you could just skip all the hard work and the thinking and everything. So these work out, pig out, I think that's a good one for the ship. And these just spin in the little holder, or you can just have the coins separately and keep them in your pocket. Um, I have uh, his way, her way. Isn't flipping a coin better than fighting with your sweetheart? I also have one that says her way on both sides that wasn't part of the original collection, but by popular demand. Once in a while, a man asks me, why don't I have one that says his way on both sides? But listen, you try to get your way all the time, you're never going to get your way. You give her her way all the time, and you're going to get your way when you need your way. Happy wife, happy life, right? When mom is happy, the whole house is happy. And this one is gratitude and entitlement. When I made this, we all know that having gratitude for our blessings is going to help us be happier. And originally, I was thinking that entitlement was the opposite of gratitude. Um, because some people, I know so many people where they think they just deserve everything. All the amazing things they have in their life, they just, oh, oh, of course I have those things. And then they're always focusing on what they don't have, thinking they're entitled to it. And they make themselves miserable. But the first woman that came and bought this, it was I had just made them. I was doing a show in Saks Fifth Avenue in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, and her husband had booted her out of the house for the day. It was her birthday. He booked her a day at the spa, and he said, when you're done, go to Saks and buy yourself a lot of things. And he told her, all you do is take care of me and the kids, and I want you to take care of yourself. So she had to learn to have more sense of entitlement. Um, Hillel said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Now, when I first wrote this seminar, I started writing, I'm about halfway through a book, and it suddenly occurred to me, I can't talk to people about breaking all the rules without addressing integrity. And all the original chapters in this presentation were things I had to struggle with. But there's two things I never had to struggle with, and one of them is integrity. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about how integrity how integral integrity is in happiness. Um, you have to remember, integrity and the law are not the same thing. So when I talk to you about breaking rules, I'm hoping that you first have such a solid foundation of integrity that you're never going to hurt anybody by breaking a rule. I should not be giving this lecture on a ship. <laughs> Reason. <laughs> Reasons to have integrity, okay? Being good and doing good is its own reward. It is the most deliciously selfish thing you can do to be good and do good in the world. And just as another added benefit of being good and doing good and having integrity, better people will be with you in all aspects of life, work, and love. Hopefully, you don't need any other reason to have really solid integrity. I tell young people, Define your core values and stick to them. 
And when you think you're smarter than your core values, you have to remember you're not because there's going to be times when you're tired or hungry or cranky or there's an easy path or, you know, something that's going to violate your core values. Sometimes you're just going to think you're smarter for the day, but you have to use those core values. It's like the foundation in a building. Polonius to Hamlet said, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day, thou cannot be false to any man. So here's another, be naughty, be nice, more of my decision coins. The next step is freedom. When trappers want to catch a monkey, they put a banana in the cage, and the monkey gets his little hand in between the bars, and he grabs the banana, and he can't get away because he won't drop the banana. And I've read, I've never seen it personally, but I've read that even when the trapper's coming and the monkey's terrified and he's jumping up and down screaming, all he has to do is drop the banana and he can leave, but he doesn't drop the banana. And I, I've showed this to, this is, um, by the way, you, what you do here is you take the banana out of his hand and then the ring comes off. Um, now, I, I showed this to people and they said, well, that certainly tells us about monkey intelligence. But I don't think it tells us about monkey intelligence. I think it shows us what we do. The hardest person to see is the one in the mirror. And think about it. How many of us have held on to pain and anger and we, and we don't forgive and forget? But when we forgive and forget, when we drop our own bananas, we move on happily with our own lives. So I call him Dr. Man, and his first name is Hugh. Hugh Man. And here's my banana earrings. Um, freedom to me is, this is just a very personal definition, but it's nothing to hide and nothing to prove. I am the most unsecretive person. There, my mother, when we were really little, she always would say, never do anything you'd be embarrassed for the whole world to know about. And that was really good advice. I have absolutely nothing to hide. Think about it. Nobody in the history of everything, anywhere, anytime was ever blackmailed, threatened, or manipulated for doing something they were proud of doing. Integrity strikes again. Now, nothing to prove was a little harder for me to learn. Um, this is me when I was in elementary school. Um, Coke bottle glasses, chubby cheeks, buck teeth, big belly. The only thing thicker than my Coke bottle glasses were the books that I like to read better than go and play in the yard. Um, Everybody nicknamed me Goober, and I did not really have any friends when I was little. The mean girls. Everybody knows. All the girls. Anyone know the mean girls? Yeah. Um, but you know what? It didn't really bother me. I learned really, really early on that I didn't really care what the mean girls thought about me. I didn't even like them. I didn't want to be their friends. So I had nothing to prove to them. In fact, if the mean girls liked me, I think I would have lost respect for myself a little bit. They were just so nasty. So I have this little smile face, and I wanted to put a Nietzsche quote on the back. And the quote says, the irrationality of a thing is no argument against its existence, but merely a condition of it. Well, obviously, I could not fit that quote on the back of my tiny little smile face. But I kept thinking about what it means and why it resonates with me so well. And I settled on the words, OK to be. Nothing to prove. It's OK to be your own crazy, wonderful self that doesn't match with anybody else. Just be the best, crazy, wonderful self you can possibly be. And there's my little smile faces. This design came from a book I read when I was a child called The Dot and the Line. It was about a dot that fell in love with a line, but the line was in love with a squiggle. And it was really funny because I read it. I I bought some of it recently, and I read it to my niece, and I realized this is not a children's book at all. It's all mathematical puns. It's hilarious. As an adult, and my six-year-old niece adored it also. So the, the line thinks that the dot is perfect from every angle, and the dot thinks that the line is stiff, and the line, as you go through the book, has to find all different ways to first have self-esteem and then make himself the best that he can do. And he finds if he works really hard, he can bend himself into an angle. And, and he makes all these amazing geometric patterns. And, you know, and then eventually, 
um, the dot realizes that the line is wonderful and in the squiggle what she thought was freedom was just sloth and she never noticed how he slurred and picked his ear and uh, the dot and the line lived happily ever after or at least reasonably so and the moral of the story is to the vector goes the spoils you should pick up the book it's really cute but these are my dot and my and the line earrings all about feeling good about yourself um, Lao Tzu also said, when you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everybody will respect you. I have to say, uh, uh, I'm, I was going to take this quote out because I wasn't so sure I care if everyone respects me, but somebody, just when I was thinking about that, came and told me how much this helped her and she explained why, so I'm leaving that in me. I don't care if everyone respects me or not. Um, these are my um, crazy pearls. I call them throwaway elegance and a little bit of wow. And I know that the pearls which are most valued and most expensive are perfectly, perfectly round with perfectly even color and no imperfections. But me, I like these because they're just crazy in their own wonderful way. And uh, here's mom and me in our jumbo pearls. Now there's a different kind of freedom. Here, I made the heart out of wings because I wanted to show a heart that's free and what sets your heart free? Forgiveness. Being angry and unforgiving is like drinking poison and waiting for the other guy to die. I, I don't know who said that, but I love it. I Googled it. I tried to find the original. Courage. This is the other thing that I never had to really struggle to find. I'm not a person who says, oh, I wish I would have done that. I'm more afraid of not doing the thing. You know, I I'm more afraid of saying, oh my God, I wish I would have done that than doing something, getting in trouble. Um, but thinking about it, I realize that courage is more than that. Good decisions come from love, from loving yourself, from loving people around you. When you make a decision based on wanting the best for everybody involved, you're going to make a good decision. The opposite of love is not hate. Love and hate are both passion. I don't, you know, it, it's just, it, it's, a wrong, it's a wrong assumption. The opposite of love is fear. Fear and love cannot exist in the same place. If I'm afraid of you, I cannot find the best of you. I can't find love for you. The fear is overwhelming. It damages me and it grips me. You have to let go of fear. So therefore, no good decision comes from fear. This is look and leap. So okay, we all know the, exp the old expression, look before you leap. Sometimes a little planning is involved, but there's also a wonderful Indian expression. It says you can't cross a chasm in two small steps. Sometimes you gotta just jump. I'm a real leap first girl. I'll be flying through the air and I'll be looking down saying, how am I gonna get down? Maybe a little planning would have been in order. But you know, we've all seen a little kid trying to work up their courage to jump into a pool that first time and stand terrified by the side of the pool for an hour. So sometimes you just have to jump into the abyss. Um, these are my stars. When my, when my, um, I was in my 30s, and my youngest brother said, Jane, I don't really understand you. You have been on your butt more times than anybody I've ever met. And why don't you play it safe? Every time you fall, you just get up and you brush yourself off and you back up and you run harder and you jump higher. Why don't you just play it safe? I did not have an answer for him. It, it was just me. I didn't know other people weren't the same way, so I had never thought about why I was that way. But I came across a quote later on that explained it, Michelangelo. The greater danger lies not in setting your sight too high and falling short, but in setting your sight too low and achieving your mark. And so I have a whole stars collection, which I wear quite often, just to remind you always to reach for the stars. E.E. E. Cummings said, it takes courage to grow up and turn out to be who you really are. You have to be yourself anyway, all the other people are taken. And then we hit gratitude. And everybody here knows we have to have gratitude if we want to be happy. One thing I haven't quite figured out yet is why we need to be reminded of things we already know. It, it is one of the benefits of my jewelry. I use my own jewelry to remind myself of my own 
core values, when I forget them, I think about how as a society, we have really, really evolved. I don't think anybody here had to sit your children down and teach them that slavery is wrong. I think as a culture, we know that slavery is wrong. I don't think anybody had to teach anyone else that women should have a right to vote, although women really had to fight for the right to vote. Think about as a culture, how we seem to just evolve in a way we don't have to teach the same things to little kids. But as individuals, have we evolved? Why do we have to learn the same things that, we, that, that we've already learned dozens of times? Piglet noticed even though he had a very small heart, it could hold rather a large amount of gratitude. Did we not read that all when we were little kids? These are my bowls of diamonds and love and gratitude. Um, when I started making jewelry, originally I was only gonna put these words on the inside. I'd read this book called The Hidden Messages in Water about how words affect water. And I thought this is the key recipe to happiness and our bodies are made of water. And if words positively affect water, I'll just sneak these words onto the inside of jewelry. And Women don't, won't know why they feel better, but they'll feel better in, anyway. And then that evolved into all these different words and symbolism. But the bowls of diamonds, the bowls overflowing with diamonds, it's just like my cup runneth over, and I have lots of different versions of it. I work in um, silver and gold. I also, because of the price of gold, I work in gold plate. If you love something of mine, I'm happy to swap out the diamonds for CZs, not here on the ship, but you know, special order. I'll work in any different way to get you the piece you want at a price that makes you happy. Um, I love these quotes about gratitude. We can only be said to be alive in those moments when our hearts are conscious of our treasures. The next step to me is faith in good. And I think sometimes people accidentally leave out one of the O's. But I think believing that things happen for a reason, but you might not know what that reason is. But more important, believing that you will be able to find the opportunity in every crisis. And here I have the lucky break heart. And you see diamonds are falling from a broken heart. And on the back, it says lucky break. And this has been the story of my life. My life has fallen apart so many times Every couple of years, it becomes unrecognizable from what it was. And the destruction phase is really scary. But if you just have faith in good, have faith that good is in there, and as painful and scary as it is, you can find that good. That's why sometimes when I'm going through a scary time, I get out my lucky break heart, and I wear it, and I just tell myself, have faith, have faith, have faith. You don't know yet what's going to happen. So here is some more Lucky Break card. I have it in different sizes. Lucky Break thinking, believe in the upside when you are down. Here and here is my friend Marty Brill. Now Marty, when we met, we had dinner, he told me the most amazing, chilling, heartbreaking story about how Marty was a, an amazingly talented concert pianist with a phenomenal career at a ridiculously young age. I and mean, he was flying, and he loved playing piano. And he had a terrible car accident, and all his fingers got cut off, and they lost one of them. And you know, and he told me this story about the terrible time he went through, both in the hospital for months and for two years afterwards. And um, I mean, it, it, it gets me upset just thinking about it. And um, you know, he, he, he will let you, t well, drugs, alcohol, self-abuse, alienating everybody that uh, loved him and that he loved and just really making a mess of things from this horrible, horrible accident and from the despair and the grief over what he lost. But what really surprised me was the next time we had dinner and we were just talking about something else completely different and he said, oh yeah, best thing that ever happened to me was this. And now, how shocking is that, even from the little bit I told you? And then he went on to tell me how his life, he, first of all, to me, the most important is his beautiful, wonderful wife, who he still adores to this day. It's so sweet when Marty talks about his wife. But his career 
be as a writer in Hollywood for Merv Griffin and screenplays and comedians. And I'm going to let you guys, first of all, Marty's on stage t tomorrow night, Marty. Some night, just keep checking Marty Brill. I think Brill is short for brilliant. And just, you got to see his show. And if he does a talk, whatever, you, you, you got to see it. And he is so funny and so charming. And talk about an unexpected lucky break. Who would have thought that that car accident was his lucky break? I, I guess the way Marty explained it to me and is that all he cared about was piano. And there was no room in his life for anything except piano. So not being able to play piano turned out to be his lucky break. Have faith in good that you will find the opportunity in crisis. And there's Marty on stage. Jean Paul Sartre says, life begins on the other side of despair. I say, try something different. Let's skip the despair. And the next is change. Change, of course, what Marty went through is all about the change that he didn't want to go through, but it turned out to be good. People are terrified of change. Routine is so comfortable, and it's so nice, and it's, and it's actually kind of convenient. You know, if I had to re-figure out how to get to work every day, you know, it would take up a lot of extra time and energy that I could spend at work. You know, routine is very comfortable. But change can also be good. And accepting change is even more important. Accepting the unknown and letting go of fear of the unknown. Because things are the way they are, they will not stay the way they are. There is nothing permanent except change. This guy, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, but that was a really, really long time ago. This again. Are we evolving, or do we have to learn the same thing over and over and over, century after century, millennium after millennium? So I have a lot of jewelry that's interchangeable. Um, you know, some women never like to leave anything alone. I don't know if any of you guys notice that in yourselves or others. Um, so I make a lot of stacking rings and different pieces that you can pull apart and put together differently, depending on your mood and your whim. And these are some of my stacking rings in my daisies. The center unscrews so you can put different color combinations together. Um, the clips, I have clips of all these different designs that can go on pearls, beads, cords, different things so you can change those looks around. This is the same bowl of diamonds on a black tourmaline choker. And the pearls are actually a very long strand of pearls that you can wear lots of different ways. And here's some other examples of the clips and everything moving around. And this is the ocean. Now, what better metaphor for the power of change and the power of adopting to change than the ocean? Again, um, going back to the Taoists, the Taoists talk about water flowing down a mountain. When the water comes to a rock, it doesn't try to go through the rock. It just changes its path, and it goes around the rock. So which is more powerful? Is the rock powerful because it says, I'm a rock and I'm standing here and you have to go around, but I'm staying here? Or is the water more powerful? Well, eventually, the water, by taking its power of following the path of least resistance, isn't using its energy to try uselessly to go through a rock. The water wears the rock into a pebble and wears the rock into sand. So now just take away, OK, so the water is flowing down the mountain, reach rock. Take away the rock, put your mother, put your boss, put somebody that's just that rock in your way. You know, you can't bang your fist through a rock. If you, if you find a brick wall is in your way, you can bang your head on the brick wall, or you can just look around and see if you can go around, or if there's a ladder to go over, or something. Take your power from following the path of least resistance. And I'm not saying give up. I'm not saying don't work really, really hard to get what you want and achieve what you want. But I'm just saying be, real, be realistic. Um, sometimes two opposite things are true. Never give up, never give up, never give up. Know when to fold them. Niels Bohr talked about a universal truth. I actually haven't made this into jewelry yet, but I'm going to. He says a universal truth is, is different in an ordinary truth. The opposite is not true. In a profound truth, the opposite is also a profound truth. So, you know, never give up, know when to fold them. Find your power from the natural flow of the universe. And the next is illusion. Another way of saying this, there are things unknown 
There are things known, there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. Another way of describing this is to remind you that we're not very smart. In this piece, I tried to make it look very light and delicate, like a little piece of silk, but it's very, very solid. And the reminder is, we aren't very smart. Now, we have to make assumptions about the world or we're going to all die. Okay, I cannot walk in front of every car to see if I get run over, if it's really going to hurt. I'm going to make assumptions that if I don't avoid the car, I'm going to get hurt. But at the same time, sometimes, so many people, th th okay, assumption, 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 and then somewhere in there are the doors of perception, and then there's, you know, truth. And some people forget to identify the things that they just believe from the things that really are true. And this can happen, you know, if you think you're in a bad situation that turns out to be good, or if you think you don't like someone who turns out to be pretty wonderful. I love this quote, the mind that is not baffled is not employed. If you think you're really sure about something you can't possibly know about, you better think again. So think about the things we can be wrong about, things that didn't happen yet, things that did happen, what's good and bad, science, people, truth, God, etc. How many things could we possibly be wrong about? I love Mark Twain said this about worrying. I've suffered through some terrible things in my life, a few of which actually happened. He also said, it ain't what you don't know that causes trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And those people that are so sure about everything, I call them often wrong, never in doubt. Now, how do we do it? How do we remind ourselves? I found this is like a little refrigerator magnet that I saw, and, and it's in Greek, but it says, if I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. Okay, I can get a refrigerator magnet and try to staple it to my head, but instead, I think I would rather wear a beautiful piece of jewelry. And I have actually used this when I was in a situation and I thought somebody was truly, truly just, I, I, no matter what I tried, I kept hitting up against a wall. But you know what? After I walked away saying, this one's impossible, I spent two weeks looking down at my reminder thinking about my core values and how am I going to portray my own core values. And I went back and everything changed. We aren't so smart. And the next is to celebrate. Okay, we've done all this work to be happy and to share happiness. So the next is to celebrate. Grapes have always represented abundance, and this is my fireworks collection. Life is a celebration. I made, I've started, by the way, making some of these designs on silk scarves, and I have the fireworks um, printed on beautiful silk crepe de chine, all hand uh, uh, seams in the sides and very, very light in the fabric. It just says, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Life is a celebration. I also made the chimp, Dr. Man, into a silk scarf. So many people asked me for the advertisement. I thought I'd make it something that if you want the message, but you don't necessarily want a piece of jewelry, I'm trying to share the message in lots of different ways. And these are more of the fireworks. Sometimes celebrating is a little bit more challenging than other times. Um, I have this in a pendant also. They're little boxing gloves. I made these for Showtime Boxing corporate gifts. But when my friend Nancy was struggling with cancer, um, about a year before she passed away, I, I gave her one. And I said, just keep fighting. And sadly, I've given away more of these boxing gloves than I've sold. But it, anyone that I've given to is you know, from my heart and really, I think, needed to remember to keep fighting. About a year before Nancy died, by the way, talk about the lucky break again. She said, Jane, as painful as this has been, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I knew exactly what she meant. Um, we'd been friends for about 20 years, and I loved her to pieces. But she certainly held on to a lot of pain and anger from her childhood. And as her body deteriorated, her soul just got freer, and her spirit just soared. And those last 10 years, while she was fighting the cancer in her body, she just became an entirely more joyful person. And the next is to give back. This is from a little exercise I do in my head when I think I'm having a bad day. I imagine all the people in the world lined up from the luckiest to the unluckiest. And I picture them for a few minutes standing in the lucky line, shifting their weight and scratching their heads. And I think about the people in the wrong end, like in Somalia. Imagine for one second of someone chops your arms and legs off for sport you can never scratch your nose for the rest of your life. 
You can never feed yourself. I mean, how horrendous. And what did I think was giving me a bad day because I, I, I am having bad sales today or because uh, I'm going to lose my apartment or I broke up my boyfriend, but I'm still fine and healthy and standing and have family and friends and opportunity. Like, even when I was assaulted and I was really struggling a little bit, I just pulled over to the side of the road. I was in Palm Beach, and I'm looking at the sky and the sea and the trees, and I'm thinking, really, what's hurt but my ego? So the key to this is to go out and find someone less lucky than you and try to help them, and whatever you think was giving you a bad time, that puts it in perspective. So the way I show this very long story is that horseshoes represent good luck, and these are overflowing with it, and on the back it says, lucky you. And that's the lucky you rings. And then is the most important concept. This is, this is what ties everything else together. This is oneness. Now, if you think that we're different from people on the other side of the world or people in another time in history, uh, some of you know this. I'm going to read it. Our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love to chatter in place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food, and tyrannize their teachers. Does anyone know who said this? Socrates. I mean, seriously, do you think that... We Lao Tzu, the, the philosopher I love so much, Taoism was, he had, he was a, he was a very loved spiritual leader, but five, 6,000 years ago, he left China because he was disgusted with, quote, the youth of today. And his followers were saying, please, please leave us something. And he wrote a tiny book of poetry called the Tao Te Ching that you can read your whole life and learn different things as you bring better perspective to it. We are all one. And I'm going to show you some different examples of that. Um, this was inspired by the butterfly effect, which comes from string theory. And I'm not smart enough to understand quantum mechanics, but I, I was kind of captivated by this story that um, the butterfly effect is a mathematical model of the universe that shows we are so connected physically that if a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon, in as little as two weeks, the air currents can cause a storm in Chicago. And I thought, wow, if we're so connected physically, how connected are we spiritually? My worst character flaw is that when I am trying to do my job and get to a place and someone is standing in my way because they're not doing their job, this horrible tone comes out of me. I mean, it is so patronizing and condescending. It's not that I yell or say bad words, but it's like... You can't unring a bell. And I try so hard to be careful and kind because that resonates. Every time you do a random act of kindness, how does that resonate? So I try to make these look like a pebble in a pond and all the different ways that the, the ripples resonate out in the world. When I was little, I thought I was trapped in my skin. I thought, you know, I, how can I ever really be close with anybody because I'm in here and, and they're in there. Um, so I realized what we do is we have this urge to bond with other people. We get married, and we make a family, and we have a community, and we have a sports team, and we have a political party, and we have a church, and we have a country, and we make all these groups that make us feel good about being connected, being one with other people. The, the, the bad part of it is when those groups make us in and somebody else out. We have to keep realizing that it's a, that we're all one. As I travel the world, I, I mean, I've been traveling the last five years on ships. I, I think this is four, four years, 10 months, my 61st cruise all over the world. Can you imagine how many places I've been and people I've met and spoken to? And I get off every day and explore. But I traveled all my life. And everybody is the same. Here's another from the butterfly effect. These hoops are actually tiny ripples and the overflow that runs through my work. It's the abundance that comes back to you. As I more and more embrace oneness, I realize the less I am, the more I am myself. You let go of ego. Can you guys hear me over the announcement? Should I keep talking? Is that OK? OK, because it's going to be like 10 minutes.
I want to talk louder and see if you can hear me. Um, and these are more of the hoops. Now, I just want to show you some pictures from around the world. Doesn't this, this is in Halong Bay in Vietnam. Doesn't this little boy look like, like the Vietnamese Huckleberry Finn? But they're not out playing. You see their hands are up because they're out looking for dollars. They're working all day long. And you see the parent or the handler takes these kids out to the tender ships so they can get dollars. And, you know, look at this little girl. She knows way more than she, than she should know. This little girl in Cambodia is named Pat. Pat was amazing, and I was so fortunate to be able to meet her. She spoke perfect English, could not ask me enough questions about my life, and she kept, like, she kept telling me, you know, she was asking me, Jane, do you have a, a boyfriend? And I said, well, no, Pat, do you? And she said, oh, no, no, my parents said that I'm too young, but um, if I stay in school and graduate, I'm permitted to choose my own boyfriend. I asked her what she was going to look for in a boyfriend, and if you think these kids are different than you, she said, I'm going to look for someone who's fun to be with and nice to me and has a good job. And um, I told her that I was looking for that same guy, and she better hope that she finds him first, because if I find him, I'm going to grab him. This is Pat and her friends. I ran into her later at, at the temple. And I know some uh, very powerful people in the world. I know some of the least powerful people in the world. And I just throw these pictures in just to give you a feeling of how much all of these people is exactly the same. Um, this is uh, it's in the chair where the Pope gets his crown. This is in Fanning Island, where we just came from. This was in Oman, where I wound up going with 20 Pakistani guys to see how they lived in one tiny, tiny room that couldn't even fit all their mats. They rolled them up, and they had one-foot cubes around the top of the room to put their worldly possessions. I don't even know one American woman that could fit her shoes in a one-foot cube. Um, everybody is exactly the same. And I'm going to prove it to you, OK? Now, we know this, right? What we feel for others, we feel ourselves, right? What we do to others, we do to ourselves. What we give to others, we give to ourselves. Because we are all one. And I want to give you an example, proof that we're one. Think about these feelings. When I hate, have envy, seek revenge, when I lie, when I cheat, when I steal, when I have malice, think about what any of these feelings feel like. I could be sitting here, maybe I hate one of you. Maybe you don't know it. If I'm sitting here hating you, my head hurts, my neck hurts, my stomach hurts, my muscles ache. I hate, and I think I'm doing that to, to one of you, but you're just going on happy with your life. You don't care that I hate you. It's not going to affect you, because what I do to you, I do to myself. Now think about this. When I love, when I'm kind and generous and honest, when you are altruistic, when you give, when you, oh, I wrote generous twice, sorry. Uh, be generous twice. What you give away, you think about it, you know, when you give someone an extra big tip or you just give someone gifts, who feels good? You're doing that in theory, you're doing that for other people, but you're really doing it for yourself. And the reason is we are all one. You know, some people say God is one, but I don't know what that means. I know that we are all one. Everyone and everything in the universe, we're all one, which also brings us back to integrity and doing things good in the world. So now I want you to just, this is my piece of heart, the peace symbol inside the, the heart and the overflowing that comes from it. I want you to just get still for a minute because I'm going to give you one idea you're not going to like very much. Um, on the back of this, it says, peace of heart. Um, think about, so I was watching a BBC program, and they were talking about child sacrifice in Uganda. And what happened was that uh, people would go to the witch doctor and pay him to kidnap and murder a child so that their business could be more profitable. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Define your core values. Everybody agrees with me so far because we're all sitting comfortably in a the theater. But if we believe in oneness, 
I have to be one with that guy. They're both those guys, the, the witch doctor and the guy that pays him. I don't want to be one with those guys, but I have to be one because if we're all one, we are. So I ask myself, who prays for the devil? Now, this is not devil worship, and this is not the thoughts of the ship. So if you have a complaint, come just if you, have a, if you have a compliment, you can write that the jewelry designer on the ship was really, really good. And if you have a complaint, you know who I am, Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Everybody can write a complaint about me by my name. Anyway, think about this story in the Bible. God and his angels were just hanging out up in heaven. And God's best friend angel, one day he said, hey, God, can you just play fair for a few minutes, just a little while? Let's just change places, okay? Just play fair. Let the glory come to me for a little while. And God did not like that. And he said, okay, no, you're down. And all your angel friends that agree with you, they're down too. So if everybody has free choice and free will, why do we create this other? When we have a sports team, we, we show that for one person to win, everybody else has to lose. But why do we have to create this otherness? Why do we have to say that for us to be good, that why aren't we praying for him? I, I'm just talking about it in theory because I don't understand why we have to have this otherness. And, and now I'm going to say, let's take this out of theory and bring it into life, into action. And, and I want to show you why this is important for you and how to put it in, into work. There was a guy a couple years ago, I told the truth about a really bad man, and he was very angry, but I'm American, and we're allowed to tell the truth, and he had no recourse. So what he did was he framed me for something I didn't do and then sued me in Cleveland. So I had to find a lawyer in Cleveland to defend me with money I didn't have, and I still owe thousands of dollars on that. And eventually the case was dropped, but it cost me a lot of money to get to that point if I didn't do it then he would have got a default judgment against me and he would own everything I would ever own for the rest of my life. And um, so I, I was really getting down. And, and just to make it worse, imagine this, okay? I had to stand up in front of people and talk about happiness and I was really depressed. So that made me feel even worse because I felt like a big hypocrite and a fake. And I was in Sydney between ships and I'm thinking about it and I suddenly thought, I'm doing the whole sports team thing, the God devil thing. I am othering him. Who prays for the devil? Okay, I never believed in evil until my 50s when I got involved with this terrible person. And when I realized that he was an innocent little baby and someone did something to him that made him so hateful and someone did something to that person. And when I suddenly stopped feeling sorry for myself and gave him my compassion. Now, it doesn't mean I'm ever going to let him in my life again, but I realized he's pathetic. He will never know love. He will never feel love for someone, because, and he will never feel what it feels like to be loved by someone because all the people love is his lies. If anybody sees what he really is and who he is, nobody's going to love that. But they fall in love with his lies, and then he feels contempt for everyone around them because they're so stupid to believe all his lies. And I said, I, then I stopped even thinking he was pathetic and I just felt such compassion and sadness for where he is in his life. And when I stopped feeling sorry for myself and I started feeling sorry for him, it took away all the power to hurt me. And so I say we are one and we have to remember that that is the good and the bad. I, I like to blame Balula, the evil twin who inhabits my body. When I do that terrible tone in my voice, I tell people, you don't want to meet Balula. But that's just me creating an outside devil because I don't want to admit that I'm bad. I'm good and I do bad. I try to always do good, but we are all one. And that means we have God and devil inside of us. We're all one. This is my bracelet called Peace to the World. The peace symbol faces out to the world and facing the woman wearing it. It says love and gratitude. Don't laugh. It can happen. I believe it. This is my peace, love, and abundance ring. Peace and love. We can get there. We can have peace in the world. It starts with you. It starts with me, with our compassion for the devil across the white picket fence. This is my peace overflowing with diamonds. And uh, just a few quick words about Artists, um, we create using gifts. We don't create the gifts. I don't feel 
ownership or possession of anything I create. And I know that without you, my message goes nowhere. Art isn't a monologue, it's a dialogue. And I need you to carry the message forward to take care of the people that you love in your lives and help them learn to be happy and wonderful and one. And um, real quick word about the, the, the process of my work. Um, again, I do not do this by myself. I have these ideas. I don't know where they come from. I have no training. I started completely by accident being a designer. And so the ideas come to me. I sit with a model maker. I draw, do drawings and discuss with him. He carves it in wax. It goes to a mold maker and then another person that makes a model that we keep. Um, my jeweler, Mike Amrani, he coordinates, assembles, polishes. He helps me find new talent when we need it. One guy casts gold, another casts silver. Frank sets the stones. Um, each piece has three finishes. It's blasted, it's polished, and then blasted with silica and acid wash. Another guy does that. Um, now I'm doing plating. Some of my pieces of handmade hinges. That's another person. Um, I do some pearl stringing. Other people do pearl stringing. Beth does wire work, and then it goes to you and the people in your life. And these wonderful people have gotten me wonderful press. But again, I'm just the face of this, but I am not the truth of it. Um, the greatest gift you can give someone is to teach them how to be happy. The best way to teach is to lead by example. The best way to learn is to teach. So I say give yourself a way to find yourself. And if one of these people pieces helps you to be the best you can be, or if you think that it will help somebody else. Remember I told you I will find the, the materials that will work best in your budget. You don't have to worry about not being able to afford anything. Um, just a reminder, I am the designer. I stand behind my work. If a diamond falls out, you can buy cheaper jewelry, but they're, they're set by machine. If a bunch of diamonds fall out, you've got a problem. If one of my diamonds fall out, it happens so rarely, I can say to you honestly, you have an apology and a replacement diamond. So know that everything I have is handmade in the USA, and it's all, you know, I stand behind everything. And um, come join me upstairs, and uh, you'll see the display I have right now. It, I didn't have enough room to show everything, but I got everything in the case. So if there's something hanging up you want to see, just grab me, and um, I can rearrange everything. And that's it. Okay, do we have a question? <laughs>